Along with that card, there was a, a, uh, another letter and a check uh, from Ebenezer African Methodist Episcopal Church in Fort Washington, Maryland. It was addressed to uh, Reverend Dr. Cheryl Townsend and the Central Baptist Church. On behalf of Reverends Granger and Joanne Browning and the Ebenezer Church family, Especially the women of Ebenezer, our prayers are with you regarding the loss of your beloved mother, Mrs. Evelyn Townsend. Please let us know as a church family if there's anything we, we can do. Enclosed is a donation of $125 payable to the Children's Fund of Central Baptist Church in lieu of flowers. God bless you and your family. Signed by the pastors. So again, we are so grateful to be part of, of uh, God's kingdom, of the broader community of of churches and the family of God and uh, uh, look forward again to how God will be at work in and among us as a church body. Would you pray with me? Father, you are great. Your love is so great. Your power, your majesty, your splendor. Father, how we thank you that you loved us in such a way that you sent Christ to be our Savior so that we could become part of your family, so that we could, could get to know you and to know and to be part of your work of what you're doing in this world. Help us today, our fathers. We open the pages of your word to understand what you are doing in this day and to understand what our place is in all of it, in the establishing of your kingdom and in the building of your church for the praise and glory of Christ our Savior. Amen. Dark Age is a strong term, I recognize that, writes Charles Coulson in Against the Night, a book he wrote quite a number of years ago. Yet in recent years I've had a growing sense of storm clouds gathering on the horizon. Material obsessions par uh, obsession paralyzes the West and political re repression grips the East. Scandals and scams are commonplace in the world. Men and women trade character for cash and sacrifice commitment on the altar of selfishness. Politicians, preachers, and professionals prey on the weak. Wars and rumors of wars fill our airways. Terrorists and hostages are nightly news. Nuclear weapons, plastic explosive handguns, and chemical warfare fuel our fears. All around us, crime rises, moral values decline, and families fragment. Indeed, the forecast is foreboding. He says, I spent the first half of my professional life in politics and public service. And he says, when I was at the White House, I was a complete secularist and confirmed conservative, and though I didn't know it at the time, I was also a social utopian. I really believed that people could be changed by government being changed. I never looked beyond the structures and the institutions and legislation into the hearts of people. But when I became a Christian in prison because of Watergate, I gained a per new perspective on the actual influence political structures have over the course of history. Listen to this. I began to see that societies are changed only when people are changed, not the other way around. The crisis is not political, it is moral and spiritual. The Jews of Jesus' day made the exact same mistake that Chuck Colson made, believing that somehow God would come in and change the institutions and therefore change people. So they were looking for King Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed Messiah, the king that would come and set up his rule and reign, deliver him from the awful, nasty, 
terrible, really bad Romans and set up a perfect kingdom where they would return to the Garden of Eden and life would be lived happily ever after. That's what they were looking for. The Jewish prayers from the time where may he set up his sovereignty or his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of the whole house of Israel speedily in the time that is near. In the process of looking for the Messiah, they missed the kingdom of God. While they were seeing, they did not perceive. While hearing, they did not understand. Jesus was indeed born king of the Jews. And he died king of the Jews. That was what was over the cross. He was the king of the Jews. And he is king of the universe. But his kingdom is not the kingdom, at least not yet, that they were looking for. In Mark chapter 1 we read, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God was near because Christ the King was in their midst. And a different kind of kingdom was about to be inaugurated. At the end of his ministry, in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, we read, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, my father promised, which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit so when they met together they asked him Lord are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel ah maybe now he's gonna do it and they still didn't quite get it with all the teaching Jesus did they eventually did but he said to them it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the age. So what is the kingdom of God? What is the nature of God's rule over people in the world today? When we read Chuck Colson's description of the world and that predated 9-11... And when we look at the nightly news and when we see what's going around, on in our own community, we think sometimes, God, where is your kingdom? We're to pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unless we understand the nature of the kingdom of God will be rather confused. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 to 14 we read giving thanks to the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light for he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son that he loves in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Paul says we are in the kingdom. We have the kingdom. We've been rescued. We've, we've been pulled away from the kingdom of darkness. And we've been placed into the kingdom of light. But what is that kingdom like? It doesn't look very light around this community or in the world that we live in. Second Corinthians chapter 4 talks about Satan being the god of this age, or god of this world. Ephesians chapter 2 names him as the prince of the air. John, in several passages, Jesus refers to the evil one as the ruler of this world, who's under judgment, who's been condemned, 
but still the ruler of this world. So again, it gets a little confusing. What is the kingdom of God? And unless we understand Christ's teaching on the kingdom of God, we will respond to life and ministry without hope and with great confusion on what God is doing. How are we to be the light in the community? What does that look like? What are we to be accomplishing? Is it the overthrow of society and to bring in God's rule, a theocracy where God is the government? Or is the kingdom of God something different than that? His rule in our lives. When we understand the mysteries of the kingdom, we will be emboldened to join God in what he is doing in our lives and in the world around us. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus reveals to his disciples the mysteries of the kingdom. And he, he calls it the secrets of the kingdom. Now, when the scriptures talk about a mystery or a secret... It's not talking about the kind of secrets that we keep from one another. Talking about that which was formerly not revealed, now being revealed to us. God had spoken much in the Old Testament about the kingdom of God, but he did not tell the Old Testament prophets everything there was to know about the kingdom of God. Some things he held back until Jesus is on the scene and reveals the mysteries, that which was before hidden, now being revealed through Jesus in the parables of Mark chapter 4. We'll look at three, not one parable today, but three parables this morning. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat, sat in it out on the lake, and while the people were along the shore at the water's edge, Jesus used the boat as his platform, as his podium. Some of the natural coves around Palestine, like the one near Capernaum, was so acoustically uh, good, <laughs> that's not proper English, I guess, uh, that a person standing in the middle of the cove could speak and 7,000 people would be able to hear that one speaker. So, so Jesus got in the boat to take advantage of the acoustics you have to wear one of these little doohickeys on your ear. But this is what he said. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, now let me stop right there again. We will get through this in a moment. Jesus taught some 35 different parables that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're not all found, but uh, in, in all the Gospels. In fact, we'll look at one today that's only found in Mark. And... Mark tells us here that Jesus, when he was on the lake, taught them many parables, and he selects three for his purposes here in this text. Now, verse 3. Listen, a farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. So other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100-fold. Now that's a really good crop. To get tenfold would have been considered you had a good crop. To get a hundredfold meant God blessed you abundantly. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Let them listen. Let them pay attention to this parable. 
He goes on. When he was alone, Jesus was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Jesus is quoting Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it, this text was a judgment of God upon those who rejected the word of God. Because they failed to accept the word of God, because they failed to obey what God said, part of their judgment would be a further blinding of their eyes and a hardening of their heart for failure to live up to what they knew God told them to do. Verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away that word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, and a hundred times what was sown. Jesus takes the time to explain this parable to his disciples. What we find, we looked at this parable back in the beginning of the year, and we spent the whole message on just this one parable. And it's good to do that at times, to understand it, but at other times to see the broader context, the bigger chunk of Scripture helps us to understand things in even a little different light. What we find when we look at this whole thing in context is that the kingdom of God is a matter of the heart. It's not what's happening out there, but it's about God's rule and God's reign in an individual's heart and in their life. And that's what the parable of the soils is all about. There are four different kinds of soils. There are four different responses that an individual can have towards the Word of God. When we looked at this before, we said... There are people that are, when the, the seed hits them, it's like hitting the, the path. They are an indifferent hearer with a hard heart. They said no to God, and their heart has become hardened. They've, they've disobeyed their conscience and has become seared and harder. It's easier to continue to do what's wrong after you do it once. And it's part of God's judgment upon us when we reject him. He says, okay. You want to go your own way? I think of the parable of the lost son. He said, Dad, I want my inheritance. And he took it and he went off and he wasted it with every different kind of immorality possible. And God let, the Father let him get to the point where he was wanting to eat pig slop. Before he finally came to his senses. How low must you go before you will bow the knee, your knee to God and do what he says rather than what you want to do. We find the hard soil is that indifferent heart. It says, well, I know what God says, but I'm going to do my own thing. 
the rocky places. Was the emotional here who had an impulse. Wow, that was great sermon. Oh my, I just love God's word. And goes out and does whatever they please. Doesn't change what they do. It was an emotional high for the day. But that was it. Nothing more. The thorny ground was the double-minded hearer who's so preoccupied with making a living and making a life and doing all kinds of things that, oh God, he just gets squeezed out from everything else that's going on. Satan's biggest tactic in our culture is busyness. I believe that. There's not a person in this room who's not busy. And it keeps us from serving God the way he wants us to. The good soil is the honest good hearer with a receptive heart. Who says with the psalmist, teach me your ways, O Lord, and I will walk in them. Give me an undivided heart. May my heart be loyal to God and to him alone. The sower is the same as Christ as he cast the seed of the good news of the gospel, the kingdom of God. The sower is any one of us who is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. As we cast our seeds of the gospel, as we go through life, some of it will fall on the, the hard, the, some of it will fall on the rocky place, some of it will fall on the thorny ground, but some of it will fall on the receptive heart. We don't ever know what's in a person's heart. And so we keep casting the seed. The good news of the kingdom. The kingdom has come among men, G.E. Ladd writes, the kingdom of God has come among men but not with power that compels every knee to bow before its glory. Rather, it's like a seed cast on the ground, which may be fruitful or unfruitful, depending on its reception. There will come a day when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. There is coming a day when that will happen, but today is not that day. Today... God still has given us freedom to choose to follow him or choose to reject him. The kingdom of God is a matter of heart. The kingdom of God is found in God's rule in individual lives as their hearts are fully devoted to him in every way. We go on and we read, he said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it on a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With a measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what, he ha what they have will be taken from them. In verse 10, he was, they were asking him about parables. And why are you teaching in parables? Why are you concealing the truth? And I believe Jesus is answering that question here in this part of the passage in verse 21. He says, it's not meant to 
to be a, a concealment to everyone. Do you bring a lamp out and put it under a bowl or under a bed? No, a lamp is to reveal things, to give light. Now, I believe that this is a little bit different than what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. This is talking about the parables are a light to those who can see. To those who have that receptive heart. The parable, the truths in the parable are hidden from those who have a hard heart. The Pharisees didn't understand Jesus' teaching. His disciples, however, did. In verse 24, he says, Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more whoever does not have even what he, they have will be taken away from them what's this measure thing it's your attention to the scriptures it's how much effort are you putting into understanding God's word that with the measure you use that will be the measure that you get back. And so basically it's, it's a warning for us that if we're not listening with a receptive heart, we're not going to receive. We're not going to understand His Word. If we're not putting into practice what we know in God's Word, we will not be able to comprehend it. In fact, even what we do comprehend will be taken away from us. And it's a warning that we listen with a good heart. The kingdom of God, first of all, is an issue of the heart. But then he goes on and he gives us other parable, another parable. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Sounds familiar. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, and then the full kernel of the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. The second parable is about the growing seed. And it tells us that the kingdom of God is a growth process. But it's a growth process that God... Where God produces the growth. You plant the seed. The farmer goes to sleep. He doesn't get up in the morning and dig up the seed to see if anything's happening under there. But he realizes that somehow all by itself it seems. The seed grows. And so the kingdom of God. Our job is to scatter the seed. But whose job is it to cause the seed to grow? It's God's job. God gives the growth. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes it to grow. So the kingdom of God is like a growing seed. It grows all by itself because God is the one who's making it grow. This word, all by itself, that's one word in the original language. It's found in one other place in the New Testament, and that's in Acts chapter 12, verse 10. Peter's in prison, and while he's in prison, there's a group of believers over here praying for his release. And so God sends an angel to Peter 
And in prison, he taps Pete on the shoulder and says, it's time for a jailbreak. You're out of here, buddy. And so he gets up and he walks past the guard. It, well, first of all, his chains fell off. Then he gets up, he walks past the guard, and he, the, the prison door is open. And he gets to the city gate, and all by itself, the city gate opens. That's our word. Who opened the city gate? God did. Now the interesting thing is, Peter gets at the house where the believers were meeting to praying for his release, and he knocks on the door, interrupts the prayer meeting, and the slave girl goes and says, uh, Peter says, it's me, Peter. She, oh, it can't be you. <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> oh, how sometimes we pray with such little faith. <laughs> how to break up a prayer meeting. Be the answer to prayer showing up, boy. All by itself. God is the one. The, the, the kingdom of God is accomplished as God mysteriously works, but we cast the seed. We cast the seed. We know there's a process. First the seed germinates and it begins to sprout its little roots. And then you see it start to grow. And then comes the harvest. One of the things that was a lesson was so important for me to learn early on in ministry. I was a youth pastor, my first job, a director of youth ministries in a church. And I was struggling, I think, with Something going on in a youth group, I don't remember now. It's been way too many years. But one of the youth leaders, older, much older gentleman, said to me, you need to keep straight your job from the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to preach the word, to sow the seed. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction and transformation in a person's life. There are times when we confuse our roles. And we try to be the Holy Spirit in someone's life. And it usually brings disastrous results. After moving to my second pastorate, a group from several months went by, and a group from my first church came down to visit us, and one of the young moms from the church saw me go into the kitchen, she followed me, and she said she just wanted to let me know that uh, you told me some things back then that I really didn't want to hear. I didn't agree with you when you said them. But God's kind of showed me that you were right. The important part of it there was that God showed her. God showed her what the truth was. And the parable of the growing seed helps us to understand that we are in partnership with God in bringing the kingdom of God to earth, but we need to understand our part and His part. And as we go forth casting seed, at times we don't even see it germinating and producing fruit in people's lives. Uh, again, back from those days of youth ministry, uh, years later, my dad was, was on the board of that church and, and he told me they interviewed a young man who, for baptism, who was in my youth, who was in my children's ministry at the time. 
And when they asked him, and I had long gone on to something else another, in another city, or I might have been in the pastorate then. But when the young man told him how he came to faith in Christ, it was at one of our children's ministries meetings where I gave the gospel invitation and he accepted Christ. And I didn't know about it for five, six, seven, eight years later. We don't know. We can't see the seed under the ground germinating, starting to grow. We don't always get to see the fruit. But when we believe that the kingdom of God means that we are cooperating with a God of the universe who makes it grow, then we can keep going, doing our part, knowing that God will do his part. The third parable is the parable of the mustard seed. Again, Jesus said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? What parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. The main point of this parable is that the kingdom of God seemingly had insignificant beginnings. It was introduced by the despised and rejected Jesus who was hung on a cross. And his 12 very unimpressive disciples. But one day it will come to its true greatness and power. And it will be seen by all the world. When on that day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But the kingdom of God starts with the smallest of seeds. In fact that seed is so small. It takes 725 to 760 mustard seeds to make one gram. It takes 28 grams to make an ounce. So it takes over 20,000 mustard seeds to weigh one ounce. It is a small, one of the smallest seeds known to man. And yet, when it grows... It grows to be a shrub that's between 10 and 15 feet tall. And so don't let the unimpressive start fool you into thinking that God is not doing something great. James says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The, Lord, the kingdom will one day come in all of its glory and power, but not yet. The mustard seed, the parable, the kingdom of God, as we see in the mustard seed, is that the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. It's not, it's now concealed, but later will be revealed in all of its power and glory. So the kingdom of God. Jesus, the master gardener, explains the secrets of the kingdom, of the secrets of the kingdom. The, the kingdom and of the garden and in the way reveals the mystery of the kingdom. Rather than a cataclysmic alteration of the world, the rule of God comes one person at a time, one heart at a time as we respond to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Although each parable contains similar elements, there's a seed, there's a farmer, Yet there's a special emphasis in each. The first one, it's in the sowing 
and the seed scatters among different soils. The second one, it's in the growing, that God is the one that makes the seed grow. Our job is to cast it. His job is to make it grow. The third parable gives us the final picture. It starts out small, but oh, one day we will see the kingdom of God in all of its glory. So the kingdom of God is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's not political change, though as citizens we should do whatever we can to have good government. But the kingdom of God is a heart issue. Secondly, the kingdom of God is a growth process. It takes time. It takes a process where God accomplishes his work. But it's God that's doing it. And the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. It is already here in the hearts and lives of people, but it is not yet what it will be when Jesus comes back once again in power and glory. Because God is king, I can have hope. Even in the chaos of this world, God is still working his plan. What Chuck Colson described as living in the dark ages, God is still on the throne. In the challenges of ministry, God is advancing his kingdom. Even though at times we don't see it. So there's a couple of life lessons for us here. The first one is that if the Lord is king of my life, I will cultivate a heart of humility that responds to him with love and obedience. If the Lord is king of my life, I will cultivate a heart of humility that responds to him with love and obedience. How about you? Is he king? Does he reign? Or are you in charge and in control? Secondly, if the Lord is king of my life, I will patiently trust him to work in my life and in the lives of others. I will know my role to come along and encourage to sow the seed, but trust the Holy Spirit to be at work in the other person's life. And I will trust the Holy Spirit to be at work in the other person's life. And thirdly, if the Lord is king of my life, I will fully embrace my role in God's mission of, the, of gospel transformation. God has a mission. And we all have a part to play in it. Ed Setzer calls God's mission the subversive kingdom, and he has a book by that title. He says, what happens when we grasp the enormity of our calling and our role within the subversive kingdom? We all have a mission, from Bob the builder to Bob the barber to Bob the butcher. Oh, I don't think he's here, but... Uh, yeah. Oh, is he? Oh, there he is. We all have a role <laughs> to play <laughs> in God's mission. Everyone has a purpose in life, Chuck Swindoll, or, or um, Ed Setzer writes. Everyone has something that gets them up in the morning and wakes them in the middle of the night. Everyone is living a purpose driven life in respect to my friend Rick Warren, one of the best selling books in history. From video games some per people's purpose in life, to working with AIDS victims in Ethiopia, to college football or working in a homeless shelter. People are designed to find purpose, and they do. Some even choose to live for the purpose of nothing, but in reality, that in itself is a purpose. Ed Setzer says, I am saddened by the trivial things that drive life for many people but I'm even more saddened by how easily I myself can get distracted from the mission of God to pursue other less important 
purposes. Jesus tells a story about David and Heidi who embraced the king's mission and moved to, to some radical conclusions as a result. They actually moved from Indianapolis to Rock Hill, South Carolina. David became the principal of a private Christian school. Moving from the big city in the north to a small town in the south, warmer climate and all, seemed like the right thing to do for David and Heidi's station in life. But what they did next was not a natural reflex reaction. They bought a rundown house on the most dangerous street in Rock Hill and named it Dream Center. Paul and Barbara Crosby made a similar move from a beautiful condominium to a street near David and Heidi. They now do ministry together and lead North Rock Hill Church to do the same. From youth to single parents to the elderly, all know that the Dream Center is there for them. People on the margins are no longer on the margins, at least on those streets. Everyone in the blocks surrounding the Dream Center hears the life-changing story of Jesus through word and deed. They are building God's kingdom. Tony Campolo gives another example. He says, one of the best examples I know of extraordinary service for the kingdom of God being done is the story of a young woman named Nancy. I met Nancy because she was a guest on a radio show on WZZD in Philadelphia. Nancy is crippled and confined to a wheelchair. Yet she's developed a unique ministry to hurting and lonely people of the city. She runs ads in a personal section of the newspaper that read, if you're lonely or have a problem, call me. I'm in a wheelchair and seldom get out. We can share our problems with each other. Just call, I'd love to talk. The results are astounding. Each week, at least 30 calls come in. She spends her days comforting and counseling people. She has become someone to lean on for hundreds of people with difficult problems. What's your part in building the kingdom of God? God has a mission. It's to transform people's hearts one person at a time. And he has a role for you to play if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It may be grand and it may seem somewhat small. But for building the kingdom our part is important, regardless of what it is. Would you pray with me? Father, it's so easy to look at all that goes around us and become afraid, become overwhelmed, and just not know what to do. Father, help us to cultivate a heart for you that listens carefully and obeys. Father, help us to trust your work in our lives and in the lives of others. Knowing that we don't see as you see. And so Lord, help us to be faithful in sharing the gospel seed. And Lord, you've gifted each one of us uniquely. Help us to find what our role is in your mission 
to build your kingdom by transforming people's lives one at a time. Then we will be a light to the community around us. So help us, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.